All right, let's go ahead and uh, begin with a word of prayer, and we will finish 2 Corinthians this morning. Lord, I ask that as we are gathered here this morning, that you would really just quiet our hearts and turn our focus and our attention onto you, that as we are confronted with some familiar texts that we just read this week, Perhaps we would see some new truths. Uh, Perhaps the dots would be connected a little bit better in our minds as to the flow of this book. But really, Lord, we need these words for our own life. We need to become more like Christ. So please feed us this morning with your word. That's why we're here. We need it. And I ask that our love for each other would increase as our love for you increases. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, if you will. This is our last week in the Corinthians, and then for the next four weeks, Shane is going to be picking up in uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So those books are going to be really exciting, kind of a whirlwind as well as we just have a week per book. But uh, let me encourage you to uh, be excited about that as we start reading Galatians uh, starting tomorrow morning. I wanted to begin by just doing a little bit of review from last week. Uh, You may remember I had this chart up on the screen there, kind of articulating this idea that Paul actually wrote four letters to the Corinthian church. That is a little disputed. Some say three, some say four. I don't think it's a a huge difference either way. Uh, But really, I think this helps lead us into the first question from chapter seven. So if you remember, after 1 Corinthians or Corinthians B was delivered to the church in Corinth, they did not respond very well. Paul did use some harsh language in 1 Corinthians. The church received it and maybe got a little tense maybe took issue with it, and Paul hears rumblings that this letter was not well received, and he says, I need to go in person and kind of dispel some of the turmoil or the tension that is happening here. So he goes to Corinth, and he describes his visit as very painful. Whatever took place in Corinth, something hurtful was said to him, there was no resolution, this was not a good visit for Paul. And so rather than going a third time to Corinth, He said, you know what, I'm going to send a letter to this church in hopes of restoration with them. And that is Corinthians C, what is called the severe letter. And he sends it by the hand of Titus. And we know that anytime you're rebuking someone, anytime there is something severe that is being said, there's always the wild card of how are they going to respond? Are they going to double down on their sin Are they going to get angry? Are they going to be hurt and withdraw themselves? Are they going to repent like Paul hopes and come back? We don't really know. Paul just says, hey, Titus, go deliver this letter to Corinth and meet me in Troas. So Paul goes along with his ministry. Titus delivers the letter. Paul does make his way over to Troas waiting for Titus. And he's not there. And Paul has to be thinking, oh my goodness. Have these people rejected me a second time now? Like, what is going on? Where is Titus? Why is he not meeting me at our rendezvous point here? Did the church in Corinth do something to Titus? Are they even more infuriated with me because of this severe letter that I wrote them? Even though there was an opportunity, Paul says, for the gospel in Troas, his spirit had no rest. And he can't stay in Troas forever, so eventually he moves on to the region of Macedonia, and it is in Macedonia that our first question kind of takes place here. According to verse 5 of 2 Corinthians, How does Paul describe his experience in Macedonia? What what does he say upon arrival to Macedonia? Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I'll just read the verse for you. Our bodies had no rest. We were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. It seems that Paul's fears have followed him to Macedonia. He's still wondering, what happened to Titus? Why did he not meet me here? So those might be the fears within. Added to that is the fears without. We don't exactly know what this means, other than that something externally was really bothering Paul. We know that he went to a lot of destinations and suffered persecution for the cause of Christ. Christ. 
So even though some of these things, these fears within, fears without, are unclear to us, we do know that Paul is just being bombarded internally, externally with these problems. Life is weighing him down. There's a mountain of just stress on him. Where in the world is Titus? I'm being afflicted. And I ask the question, obviously rhetorical, but have you ever felt this way before? When Paul says that his body had no rest, do you know what that is? Have you ever felt just the stresses of life piling up higher and higher and higher and just feeling like, how in the world am I ever going to get out from underneath this? Life is hard. And sometimes in the midst of the hardships of life, we can begin to even direct some questions towards God and say, God, where are you in the midst of all this? Don't you know what I'm going through? The following questions are really designed to help us think about God's character even in the midst of trials. And it begins with this description of God in verse 6. How is God described in verse 6? Diane, say that one more time. Yeah, he's described as the God of all comfort. God who comforts the downcast. I want you to think about that for just a second here. God who comforts the downcast. What an awesome description of our God. It reminds us that God is not indifferent to the circumstances of our life that he doesn't sit in heaven with his arms crossed looking down at us saying, saying, what's going on with these people? Can't they get it together? God sees people, even emotionally downcast people, and he is moved to comfort them. And and this is not just a one-off description of God. We see God comforting the downcast in the Old Testament, In the New Testament, I thought of just a couple of examples. Uh, In the Old Testament, the first one that came to mind, or one of the first, rather, was that of Hannah, just pleading with God for a son. She has been berated by her husband's other wife. She goes to the temple. She is crying, distressed. Eli thinks she's drunk. And in reality, she is so overwhelmed in her spirit for a son that she is pouring out her emotions to God. And what happens? God gives her a son. In the New Testament, I thought of Jesus coming across a funeral. And rather than waiting for this woman who has lost her son to come to him and ask for a miracle, Jesus sees this woman and goes to her. And he raises her son from the dead and comforts her. Right? We need to have this picture of God in our minds that he is a comforter that he comes to the rescue of those who are hurting. According to verses 6 and 7 from this text, what did God use to comfort Paul? Jeff. Uh, Yeah, the coming of Titus. Here Paul is. Missed Titus and Troas. Now he's in Macedonia. And can you imagine the euphoria that he feels when he finally sees Titus? Oh my goodness, where have you been? What news do you bring from Corinth? Obviously, we know it was good news. These people responded well to Paul's severe letter. They repented. They're restored in their relationship. They are back to following God. This is awesome. And I appreciate that Paul takes care to point out that this was God at work here who was comforting him. A lot of people would say, well, eventually Titus would cross paths with you, right? You know, he knows if he misses you in Troas to go to the next point. Paul says, no, 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 no. This is God who comforts the downcast. This is something that he orchestrated to comfort me. I had us turn to Psalm 34 for this last question here because we have another description of God and the comfort that he offers here. I'll start off just by reading the verses for you and then ask you what encouragement they brought to you this week. So Psalm 34, beginning in verse 17, it reads this, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. What encouragement is 
What phrases from that verse stood out to you about God and his relationship to those who are downcast? Tammy. The Lord hears and delivers. Yeah, the Lord hears and delivers. Any other descriptions from that psalm that were encouraging to you? Dan. Yeah, that's the one that leapt off the page to me as well. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. That seems so contrary to our experience sometimes. We feel brokenhearted and God seems distant, and yet the Psalms are reminding us the Lord is near to those who are hurting. And this helps break the caricature that we have of God sometimes as giving people a stiff arm or being angry at them or being frustrated with them. The Psalms are very clear in painting this picture for us. God is near to the afflicted, to the brokenhearted. He delivers them. What an awesome picture of God that we have in these verses here. And this is a picture of God that spans the Testaments. Old, new, God is a comforter. Our second question has to do with what is called the severe or tearful letter. According to verse 8, why does Paul say that he temporarily regretted sending that letter to the Corinthian church? He said there was some regret or apprehension he had about sending that letter. Did anyone see why? Jeff? It, it them. Yeah, it grieved them. He, he knew that this church that he loved very much was going to be on the receiving end of a rebuke. And no one likes to hurt people that you love, although this was a necessary rebuke. It grieved Paul that he had to write such a strongly worded letter to these people. But according to verse 9, what was a positive outcome of this grief. Brenda? They repented. Yes. Uh, Paul's strong words had the desired effect in their lives. And one of the interesting things about verse 9 here is that Paul actually characterizes their grief as godly. Now, maybe that initially strikes us as kind of strange. How can grief be godly? And we need to think about this in the context of the passage. Paul is not saying if you're sad that your dog died or that you dropped your ice cream on the ground and can't eat it and you're sad about it, that that's a godly grief. No, not quite. Paul is specifically talking about what is your response to being confronted with sin? And there really seems to be two options here. There is either godly grief or worldly grief. And Paul actually spent some time painting a picture of the contrast between these two types of grief, and that is found in verse 10. We'll just take them one at a time. How is godly grief described in verse 10? What does it produce? Uh, Michelle? Yes, it 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 leads to a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. And I'm sure that you know this, but repentance is more than just remorse. Repentance is more than just feeling sorry that you did something. The repentance that Paul is describing here is a complete 180 in your life in regards to the sin that you have just committed. It is an acknowledgement that you have grieved a holy God. You have violated his commandment and you are saying, I want nothing to do with that. It is David being confronted by Nathan the prophet about his sin and immediately confessing and repenting of it. It is that repentance that we see in Psalm 51 that says, Purge me, O God. Wash me whiter than snow. And the result of this repentance is a salvation, the forgiveness of sins, the knowledge that you will not be condemned for your wrongdoing because it has already been paid for. Now, in contrast, Paul also talks about a worldly grief. And what does the worldly grief produce? Copy. Death. Death. Yeah, death. A lot of commentators seem to be in agreement about what worldly grief looked like. It wasn't this totally turning your back on a sinful lifestyle. It was more remorse over being caught. Remorse for the consequences that you might have because of your sin. So it's the person who sees his marriage crumbling because of some sinful choices he made and says, well, this is unfortunate. 
It's the person whose job is at stake because they were unethical and they think, yeah, I'm sorry about that I got caught and that I'm suffering consequences for it. You know, we could go really dramatic and say it's the person in jail or someone who has to pay a fine that is sad that they did such a thing. But given the opportunity, they would commit that same sin all over again, just be sneakier about how they went about it. That is worldly grief. And it produces death. They are not delivered from the consequences of their sin. And you may be wondering to yourself, how do I know which one is true of my life? How do I know if I have godly grief or worldly grief? And Paul actually goes on in verse 11 to offer some evidences of a person that has godly grief. What were those things? Tell me. Yeah, yeah, you just read the list right out of verse 11 there. Look at it again. Paul says, see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. Simply put, we could look at each of these, I guess, but these people were not passive in response to their sin being confronted. They took initiative in repenting. They demonstrated passion and righteous indignation towards their sin. They handled their sin in such a way that communicated that they were agreeing with God that this is a bad thing. Can I encourage us this morning to consider our own repentance? To think about the sins that unfortunately plague us at times and to consider which grief we are evidencing in our life. When we sin and are caught for it, is it a, can't believe I got caught for that? Or is there a genuine, godly grief that is moved by the fact that we have committed an offense against a holy God, one who died for us, and we want to put as much distance between ourselves and that sin as possible, and we cry out and say, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned again. I'm doing this all the time. Would you give me the grace to say no to these things? Would you take the lusts that I have for this world and what it offers and just remove them from me? Lord, make me more like you. That is godly grief. And we have that wonderful assurance in 1 John that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Moving on now to chapter 8. Chapter 8 introduces uh, Paul talking about an offering that he is collecting for the saints in Jerusalem. This offering actually consumes a significant chunk of the scriptures. I didn't realize this myself, but Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians. He mentions it in Romans. There's something about an offering in Galatians. I don't know if it's the same one, but really Paul was concerned with taking up this offering for the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And you might be wondering to yourself, what occasion is there for these people to be receiving an offering? Why are they so poor? There's a lot of theories thrown out as to why the Jews in particular needed uh, some financial relief. Uh, One of the theories is that they were suffering uh, persecution and no one was coming to their aid. A theory that had maybe some biblical support for it, as well as was personally intriguing to myself, is that there was a famine that had been ravaging the land for quite a while now, and it had hit Jerusalem particularly hard. And I say this has some biblical evidence for it, because if you remember back in the book of Acts, there was this prophet Agabus who shows up to the church in Antioch, and he pronounces that there's going to be a famine over the whole world. And immediately the church in Antioch says, man, we got to help our brothers in Jerusalem. And so they take up an offering and send money to the church in Jerusalem as relief. Now, it's possible, I guess, that this famine that Acts records is still going on at the time of Paul, and he is still trying to raise funds to help these people who are in the midst of a famine. Again, we don't really know what is going on here other than that Paul is really burdened to take up an offering and provide some financial aid for these Jewish people. And he begins his appeal to the church in Corinth by talking about how the church in Macedonia responded to this request. According to verses 2 and 3, 
How had the people of Macedonia replied or responded to Paul's appeals here? Claire. Yeah, they were incredibly generous. And yet, as one commentator pointed out to me, notice verse 2. They did have a wealth of generosity, but their financial status was actually that of extreme poverty. If the church in Macedonia was extremely impoverished, do you think that the amount they gave was really impressive? Probably not. And yet, what is Paul pointing to? Not the amount, but the heart behind it. These people were generous even in their poverty. And I want you to notice, if you're looking at chapter 8 yourself, just look at some of the descriptions of these people. In verse 3, they gave according to their means, even beyond their means, of their own accord. Verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking relief, part in the relief of the saints. Verse 5, and notice what they did first. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And these people are described as generous, although they are incredibly poor. What an example to us. That generosity is not about the amount that we give, but about the heart that characterizes us. And Paul tells the Corinthians all of this so that they would consider their own response to the collection that is being taken. Paul says, you guys have an opportunity here to do what in verse 8? What has this offering given them an opportunity to do? Lynn? Yeah, to show that their love is genuine. These people have an opportunity by opening up their wallets, so to speak, to show that they genuinely love other brothers and sisters in Christ. It reminds us here that love takes action. I was reminded of in James, James talks about um, the person who sees someone in need and they say, go in peace, be warm and filled, and that's all they do. They, they just say those things. Paul says, this kind of person, their faith isn't alive. Similarly, one of the ways that we can show genuine love for one another is to take action, to demonstrate it by doing so at cost to us at times. And as an example of this, Paul gives us the ultimate example, really, in verse 9. Who does Paul point to as motivation for why we also should be generous? Lynn? Jesus. Yeah, let's just read verse 9 together here. Paul says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by your, his poverty might become rich. Obviously, this is not talking about material wealth. A lot of us who are in Christ are still poor. What it is talking about, though, is that Jesus left the glories of of heaven and became a servant, as Philippians 2 describes. The lowest of the low, all so that he might live an entire life on earth, die on a cross as a criminal with our sins placed on him so that we might become rich, so that we might inherit eternal life and partake in the blessings that he offers us. Jesus is the, the ultimate example of generosity. As the chapter continues, and Paul is continuing to talk about this collection, he gives the credentials of three men that he is sending to collect this offering here. One of the men is named Titus. We know Titus. The other two guys are described as being uh, first famous among all the churches for spreading the gospel, and the other is said uh, to be often tested and found earnest in many matters. It is evident to us that Paul is sending these three well-respected men to collect the offering in Corinth. And that kind of brings us to our first question, why? Why is Paul being so careful in sending godly men to pick up this money? Why does he say according to verse 20? Tell me. To be blameless. Yes. Uh, Let's see, we take this course so that no one should blame us. Exactly. 
what is the driving principle behind Paul's actions? You can answer that in just a second here, but Paul is obviously worried that people are going to see him collecting all this money and think, he's skimming off the top. As he makes his way from Corinth to Jerusalem, some of that money is going to get lost, and we're not going to be able to give the full amount that he had originally started off with here. Paul has taken great care to protect himself. Yeah, to be blameless. Great word, Timmy. That's awesome. So what is the driving principle behind Paul's actions here in verse 21? He just tells us, I am doing this for this reason. Go ahead again, Timmy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that twofold uh, aim to be honorable in the sight of God and man is really interesting. Earlier in 2 Corinthians, Paul had told us, hey, my aim is to please the Lord. We understand that. But now Paul is also concerned that he does what is honorable in the sight of man. He knows that his public testimony is at stake. How do these verses instruct us in how to live today? What application can we make to our own life from what we see here in these verses about just taking an offering of all things? Any thoughts on that? Claire? Yeah. Totally. Yeah, do everything to the glory of God. What else? Anything else come to mind? Lisa? Lisa? Yeah, totally. John? As you say, have integrity so that who we are in front of people is who we are when we're not in front of people. Definitely. Yeah, have integrity. Mike? Be transparent so that we can know about God. Exactly, yes. This is really at the heart of what I was trying to get at here. Like we see Paul giving us an example of even what he does in public being blameless, above reproach, so too should we look at our own practice of Christianity and think, am I behaving in such a way that is bringing reproach on myself? Maybe it's in regards to, you know, our work ethic, a relationship with a coworker, uh, what we're liking or sharing on social media. I mean, you name it, there's all sorts of applications for this. Are we doing all of our actions in a way that not only pleases the Lord, but takes into consideration other people? and what they might think of us, what it might be saying about the Lord and our relationship with him, totally. And like John said, it's certainly easy to be above reproach when your boss is staring at you, but how about when no one's around? Are you trying still, even then, to behave in such a way that is honorable both in the Lord's sight and in the sight of men? Yeah, really good point. Chapter 9 continues this discussion on giving, and Paul is now talking about some principles of giving to the church in Corinth here, and he gives us three, maybe more in the text, but I just picked these three from verses 6, 7, and 10, and 11. Let's just work through those one at a time. Paul gives some principles here. Verse 6, how would you describe the principle that you see about giving? Jeff. Yeah, exactly. You reap what you sow. There is a direct relationship between what you give and what you receive. Now, does this mean that if you give 100 bucks to someone, you're going to open up your mailbox and there's a $100 bill just chilling there? Not necessarily. No, although I'm sure some of you could give testimony to something like that happening. What we have to understand is what we reap in this life will sow in the next. There is eternal significance to the things that we give, the sacrifices that we make in this life. How about verse Seven, there's a really interesting principle here. What principle about giving is Paul demonstrating for us? Lynn? Exactly. Yeah, give from the heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Paul has taken great pains in these two chapters to not twist the Corinthians' arm and say, give me your money. And this is kind of the fulfillment of it here in verse 7 when he says, listen, I'm really asking you guys to give what God has already laid on your heart here, not under compulsion, God loves a cheerful giver. 
How about verses 10 and 11? There's another principle about giving here that we need to consider. Did you see it in the text? Hutch. Exactly. Paul is demonstrating for us that God is present throughout the giving process. He is the one who gave us these things in the first place. He is the one who can see this harvest uh, yielded at the very end of our generosity. He uses the example of a farmer saying that God supplies the seed to a farmer on the front end, but God also determines how much he will reap at the end. God is throughout the process totally. And I didn't include this as one of the questions, but Paul actually describes the harvest or the yield that this gift of generosity is going to reap for the people in Jerusalem. He says that they are going to give thanks to God. They're going to glorify God. They're going to long and pray for those who have given the gift. I mean, just imagine being a Christian in Jerusalem, receiving money from someone you don't even know 700 miles away. What is going to be your response to this just unexpected gift? Wow, God is awesome. He provided for my needs with people I don't even know. And your heart is going to go out to the Corinthians. and You're going to say, wow, these people love me so much. They don't know my face, they don't know my name, and yet they still, out of their generosity, gave to me. Then we come to the last question from chapter 9, and I encouraged you to look at Luke chapter 12 and read Jesus' conclusion about possessions here. There's this man who comes up to Jesus and wants him to be an arbitrator in a dispute that he has with his brother. His brother has taken all of the inheritance money, leaving him with nothing. And Jesus says, I'm not a judge. I'm not going to get in between you guys. But I do have some advice for you. What is Jesus' conclusions about possessions according to Luke 12, 15? Claire, or let me ask Andy actually. Yeah. Greed doesn't get you to heaven. Greed doesn't get you to heaven. Claire? Life doesn't consist of an abundance of things that we have. Exactly. There is more to life than just collecting all these possessions. And Jesus goes on to describe the parable of the rich fool who spends his whole life accumulating all these goods, building new barns he's about to do, and he dies that very night. And the Bible's um, declaration about him is that he is a fool because he can't take that money with him. And he spent his whole life making sure that he was comfortable only to die. And Jesus says, life is so much more than the abundance of possessions. A hundred years from now, none of us in this room are going to care about the possessions we accumulated. Live for that which has eternal value. And so I hope that second question, a rhetorical one, was encouraging to you to think about your perspective of material wealth and to consider what the Bible's instructions would be for us about investing not in this life, but in the life to come. We come to chapter 10, and there is a three-chapter spread here from chapters 10, 11, and 12 that honestly are just a little strange. If you read them this week, maybe you were a little bit confused. There is some language in here that, if taken out of context or with no like understanding of what's going on, seems very strange to us. Paul talks about how he didn't rob the Corinthians. He says, Uh, I'm boasting in this instance. I'm speaking foolishly here. Uh, What else does he say? He says, I have a divine jealousy for the church. And so we read words like jealousy, boasting, foolishness, and we think, uh, this sounds very uncharacteristic of the Apostle Paul, let alone any believer. These are obviously not character traits that any of us should be emulating. So how is the Apostle Paul getting away with this? Why is he allowed to boast? Why is he allowed to feel this jealousy and... uh, Uh, This, why is he talking about speaking foolishly? Well, here's what we can understand from the context of 2 Corinthians. It would appear that there are false teachers in Corinth who have attacked the Apostle Paul personally, saying that his stature isn't all that imposing. He's not really a commanding personality. Saying that his speech, not that good. He's not really good as a public speaker. Now, it's one thing to attack Paul personally, But what was happening is that these people were introducing false teaching. And so when the Corinthians, who are actually believing these false teachers, and like their view of Paul is being undermined, not only is it Paul that is being undermined, but it's his message that is being undermined. And so these people are actually being turned away from the true gospel and believing false teachings. And Paul says, I cannot let this happen. I have a divine jealousy for you guys. I love you. 
I cannot let you be turned away by this false teaching. And so, he says, in order to restore the credibility that I have with you, I need to boast a little bit. I need to tell you about my credentials that make me a true apostle, that make me the messenger of the Lord so that you will believe my message again. And even as Paul is boasting, he says, this is foolishness. It is ridiculous that I have to boast right now. Even he knows that boasting is foolish, that it should not be true of a Christian. But in this unique instance, Paul has to give us his credentials as an apostle so that the Corinthians will say, you know what, your message is the true one. So in the midst of all this, coming back to chapter 10, when we see this language, Paul talks about this warfare that he is in right now. And according to verses 3 and 5, what does a Christian wage war against? Not the flesh, actually. Lynn? Yeah, lies and deception against the knowledge of God. Yeah, Paul takes great pains to say, we are not waging war against the flesh here. There is something greater going on. We would say even spiritual realities that Paul is fighting against. And how are his weapons described? How does Paul describe his weapons in a word or two? John? Yeah, they have divine power to do what? In verse 5, what do these weapons have the power to do? Destroy strongholds. Yeah, knock down the lofty opinions about themselves and against God to take thoughts captive. See, Paul isn't going into battle here with a sword and a bow and arrow. He is going into battle with divine weapons that have power to overcome spiritual forces. And I think we could conclude from the rest of the scriptures that what Paul is describing here is the word of God that is described in Ephesians as being a sword, that is described in Hebrews as being a sword that pierces even to the joints and marrow, to the thoughts and intents of the heart. Paul realizes, I'm in a spiritual battle here. I have to be equipped. And this battle continues into chapter 11, as he talks about these false teachers and the threats that the Corinthian church is facing, according to verse 3 and 4, what is Paul's fear for the Corinthian church? He has a very specific fear for them. What is it? Brenda? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he says, I'm worried that you guys will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And the threats that this church is facing is very subtle. If you're in chapter 11, I want you to look at verse 4 just to see how subtle these threats are here. Notice he says, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. He is saying there are people who are coming and proclaiming another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, and you guys are being led astray by this. This is not something that was just epidemic in Paul's time. It is continuing to this day. There are Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses who talk a big game about a Jesus and a gospel, but a closer evaluation of their religion reveals that it is not the Jesus of the scriptures. It is not the gospel of faith alone in Christ alone. And Paul is saying, be alert. Just because something is called Jesus does not mean it is the Jesus of the scriptures who can save you. There is one true gospel. And Paul makes a point about Satan and these false teachers that should put us on alert in verses 14 and 15. What point does Paul make, Jeff? Um, that he and his yeah. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The false teachers look like these messengers of righteousness. They give a really good appearance. These false religions are very subtle. They are attractive. They look nice and shiny on the outside. They are not innocent teachings, though. These have satanic origin. They are condemning people. And so I encouraged you as the final part of question 11 to look at Ephesians chapter 6 and the armor of God to consider the spiritual realities that Paul talks about that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against spiritual 
forces. We have to be aware of this. We have to equip ourselves. Satan is a roaring lion, Peter says. Ephesians says he's chucking these darts at us. So use the armor of God that is available to us to combat him. Realize that there is more to this life than we can see. There are spiritual realities that are taking place that we have to be equipped to fight ourselves or to fight against. Chapter 12, very quickly, Paul is still in the process of we would say boasting. He is talking about what makes him a true apostle in opposition to these false teachers. He said all of these things about his heritage and the suffering that he's faced. When we get to chapter 12, Paul says, I've actually been to heaven. How's that for a trump card about who's the true apostle and who's not? Paul's been to heaven and he's seen great revelations, but according, well, Along with going to heaven, he's also given what he calls a thorn in the flesh, what's described as a messenger from Satan. According to verses 7 through 10, for what reason is Paul given this thorn in the flesh? There's a very specific reason, a uh, cuppy. To keep him from fried. Can you imagine going to heaven and seeing all these things and then coming back down and being like, yeah, who else gets to experience this, Right? So this thorn in the flesh was actually to keep him humble. And Paul prays three times that this thorn would be removed. And what answer is Paul given each time? You can just say it. No. Yeah. His grace is sufficient. How does Paul respond to this answer that he's given? After being told that the thorn's not going to be removed, my grace is sufficient for you, what does Paul conclude then? Claire? He takes pleasure in it. I mean, his purpose is that God has purpose for him. Yeah. What a mature response to suffering. He says, if suffering means that Christ's power is going to be magnified in me, then bring it on. I'll take suffering if it means that Jesus' power is going to be even more, that more apparent to us. And so how does this passage then help us to view our own trials and hardships? What are we, some conclusions we should make about suffering that we experience in this life? Any thoughts on that, Cuppy? Totally. Totally. Great answer. God, what do you want me to learn from this? Awesome. Any other thoughts? How about, (laughs) Lord, are you trying to keep me humble for any particular reason? Really good chance that the suffering we face is to keep us humble. So what is our response in trials? Is it to think, well, I can do this on my own? Or is it to throw ourselves on the mercies of God? Yeah, great answers. Thank you guys so much for your participation today. And uh, sorry we couldn't get to the end about Corinthians, but I hope that this book was an encouragement to you for myself. A couple things that stood out to me was just the emphasis that Paul places on unity in this church. He is very concerned that this church be one body. Secondly, he is concerned that they be distinct from the world. Like I mentioned at the beginning, Corinth is like modern day Vegas, New York City, and LA. It is a very secular culture, and Paul wants this church to be distinct. Let's pray. Lord, we are very grateful for just the chance to read this book, that you've preserved it for us, and we can learn things, even from 2 Corinthians. We don't turn there a whole lot, but there is a lot for us to consider in these pages. Help us, Lord, to be distinct from the world and to be unified as your body, really, Lord, as we are united under Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.